How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling, and uh, we had no shortage of things to talk about. Brian Alvarez is going to be here. We're also going to have Rico Constantino of Ohio Valley Wrestling up uh, in probably about a half an hour and uh, talk about his training uh, in uh, pro wrestling and uh, his current status. He's got a very unique story. We've had him on the show once before, and uh, it's kind of <laughs> kind of interesting the day that we have him on because it's such such a newsworthy day. I guess... Um, I am not clear of, of exactly what happened uh, at a couple of hours ago. Um, I know that uh, Vince McMahon was on Mike and the Mad Dog and WFAN. And I, uh, anyway, apparently Phil Mushnick called in. Apparently fireworks ensued. I've only talked to one person who actually heard it and who didn't really give me much in the way of details other than, um, and I thought that, and, and I don't know if we'll be getting a tape, but anyway, if you live in New York and you were listening, Please call and let us know what happened, because <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Vince McMahon was also on Howard Stern today. The sale of WCW to Vince McMahon, this is the Vince McMahon show. Anyway, the sale of WCW to Vince McMahon, they were negotiating today. I have gotten a couple of phone calls from people in the industry who said that the deal was finalized. I have not been able to confirm that with the WWF. I just, in fact, tried about five minutes before we went on the air. So I don't know that it's confirmed that it's done, but it's pretty close. Vince McMahon was actually on the Stern show talking about it and said, like, in all likelihood, we will be owning the company. Pretty much said that they would run it as a separate organization, but didn't go into a whole lot of detail about that. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that a lot of people are speculating, like Shane McMahon would run the company. The same stuff that we were speculating about when McMahon almost bought WCW several months ago. Uh, it is all, at this point, just speculation. And um, I'm assuming that they'll probably make some sort of a statement very soon. And um, last night was the final wrestling show on TBS after 29 years. The final show of World Championship Wrestling in, in its current form will be Monday. And um, aside from that, I don't know. Can't add anything else. Brian, any other big news? As far as news, no, nothing. Anything, anything, what's going on? <laughs> How are you doing? I have a story today that has absolutely nothing to do with uh, the wrestling world. Actually, it does. And it will um, interest absolutely nobody except you. But I'm going to tell it okay. anyway. Okay. Every Tuesday night, and you will relate to this, I email the newsletter to the print shop, and they print up the newsletters, and I go pick them up Wednesday. There's this giant box of newsletters. I take them home. I put stamps on them. I put labels on them. I bundle them up and put rubber bands around them, put them back in the box, take them to the post office, drop it off, and they proceed to uh, mangle them and deliver them in the wrong <laughs> Destroy them and rip them up, yeah. Not deliver them at all in some cases. Well, right. anyway, I thought that... Uh, I've seen the stupidest thing ever many times with the post office, and they uh, topped it today. When uh, Yesterday, when I brought the box in, as I've been doing for uh, six years now, full of newsletters, stamped, labeled, and bundled. What did they do, Dave? They taped the box back shut. They mailed it back to the print shop with a oh, bill gosh. for postage due. Oh, my God. So that means that, that only only of the week... Of the biggest news story that you've ever covered. I was covered. up so late Tuesday night to get this thing done. I worked my ass off Wednesday to make sure they all went out on time. And the post office delivered them back to the print shop. So so you're going to be like a couple of days late on, on the biggest story you've ever covered? Yeah. That is just so And seriously, weird. I think it was like the longest article I ever wrote. And I was so happy. And I thought, man, it's done. And what do they do? They mail it back to the print shop. I've actually never had that one happen. I've had many things happen, but not quite that. Guys, we got a couple of callers on the line from New York who uh, actually listened to the uh, the whole interview. So uh, if you want to go to them right Let's here. Let's go. All right. It's, Let's uh, go. First up is Gerard. Gerard, what's going on? How you doing, Dave? How you doing, Brian? Tell us an interesting story. Um, yes, yes, uh, yes. Make us happy. <laughs> first off, Chris Russo is the guy they call Mad Dog. He, he yeah. doesn't like Vince. You could tell he's laying into him, trying to get all these... Vince to come up with some cockamamie answers, but Vince kept blowing them off. Tell those Russos. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, right? And then uh, Mushnick came on and uh, started bringing up stuff from uh, 1990, about when Vince's doctor went to jail for prescribing steroids and going into how Vince used steroids and every mm -hmm. other wrestler used it. Then he brought up that two guys who worked for Vince were pedophiles, and Vince says, well, if they were, how come uh, no charges were ever brought against it? And all, he kept, all Mushnick kept saying was, well, you told me they were. You called and told me they were. It's because you're out of your mind. Actually, as I remember, uh, I think I mean, the, the two guys he's talking about were Mel Phillips and Terry Garvin. I think it's pretty well established, that one. Anyway. Yeah. And then he started as far as then, Terry, uh, you know, Terry Garvin, of course, has passed away several years ago. But we had, we had Tom Cole on the show, and 
you know. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, then uh, the other announcer, uh, Mike Francesca, said to mm-hmm. Phil, uh, tell us something within the past five years that annoys you about Vince. <laughs> so he says, all right. A couple years ago, my ten-year Mushnick says my ten-year-old daughter comes home from school, and the other ten-year-old boys were calling all the girls bitches and hoes. And I personally blame Vince McMahon for this. Now, come on, no kid ever bought a rap CD or something where they're going to hear words like that. The man has such a personal vendetta against Vince McMahon, it's unreal. And they were not taking any calls, so he couldn't even call in. It, was, it drove me nuts. I was screaming at my radio in the car. I wanted, I wanted to drive up there and, and, and punch him in the mouth. <laughs> I couldn't help it. You too. But Mushnick is, what a vendetta. And he's, it's ridiculous because his, his editorials in the Post, on the same page where he's bashing Vince about how you have to have good ethics, there's uh, ads for strip clubs. It makes no sense. If he's bashing Vince so bad, why doesn't he turn around and, and start bashing New York Post for having well, ads for strip actually, clubs um, and everything? Actually, it's pretty well known that, that he worked real hard to get um, you know the, the gambling stuff out of the New York Post. And I don't know what he—I don't know if he's done anything on strip clubs or not. But um, so you know, I mean, there is—he has worked pretty hard on some on some instances, uh, you know, in that in that regard. You know, you know the one like the one problem that Vince uh, or Phil Mushnick is always going to have is that he really gets riled up, especially oh, like on the talk show. Puffing, you hear him and breathing Vince through the McMahon phone. is so good at just lying and just being completely calm. Oh, Unless great. he wants it's to be great Mr. Listening Mr. To Vince except, on, except on Costas, where well, he, he wanted to be Mr. Wasn't. McMahon. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, you know what's funny is, Vince well, Romo. I don't want to bring that up because I'm go ahead. Yeah. What's that? Nothing, nothing. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? No, that's about it. It's just that uh, uh, it makes me mad that everybody who brings Vince on any type of show tries to roast him so bad and they just can't do it. They try their well, hardest Co- and he just, Vin- he just... Vince did it to himself with Costas, though. <laughs> I mean, Costas didn't roast Vince. Vince roasted himself. Oh, you saw that. But, I mean, he, he was Mr. McMahon on that that interview. He wanted well, to show everybody. That, 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 was not, that was not good judgment to be Mr. McMahon. No, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Okay, guys, that's about it. Okay, good enough. Thanks so much, Jared. Let's go to John. John, what's up? Hey, Dave. Hey. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing really good. Hi, Brian. I, I can hardly hear you guys, but here's the story. Uh, much to call in. McMahon was in the studio on the fan. Uh, for quite a while. He was on for about an hour and 20 minutes. They were wow, pretty, they were pretty easy on him, both Mike and the Mad Dog, and, uh, they, they freely admitted they knew nothing about wrestling. They asked him about Owen Hart, the usual that's, that's, question. That's, that's, Wait a you know what? Weren't they the ones that said they were going to do a better job than Costas? Well, yes, they were. Yes, they were. And here's the other one, too, is that, um, when you go in there and you just go, we're bringing on the number one guy who's most, uh, even though he does run a football league, right. he's far more famous for being a wrestling promoter. And the first thing he goes, by the way, we know nothing about wrestling. You know, it's like, it's like, do your goddamn homework. Okay, yeah, go but the whole premise of the interview before they brought him on, because lots of callers were excited and they're going to have Vince McMahon on, they said they weren't going to touch wrestling. It was strictly XFL. And what happened is, I'd say 80% of the interview ended up being wrestling. So at, at some point, <laughs> and they don't know they, anything about wrestling. Wonderful. Yeah, exactly. And, and each time they'd ask a question, they'd say, "Well, we we know nothing about it, but we just want to ask you about, you know, Owen Hart died." And <laughs> oh God! Vince had all the right answers, of course. You know, no one saw the Owen Hart tragedy. Not even the kids in the audience, because the lights were down. Oh yeah. Well, that's and no not, one that's knew not... what happened. And by the time the lights came back up, well, that's no one no one really had had any idea what happened. So no one was. That's not true. By that. I spoke to many people. I spoke to many people who saw it right in front of their eyes. Yeah, of course. Many but people. Like, it, it, it was like, also funny hours when, after uh, it happened. He he said, uh, you know. He denied, you know, responsibility. He said he kept saying over and over again, Tinkerbell does the same stunt in Disney World three times a day. So I don't know if that's true. Well, I don't know either. And, and he also said the apparatus. term. He said uh, not, not with that apparatus and certainly not without the same lack of safety. Right, I would sure. Think. But, but he also says, uh, you know, the Turner organization has a fellow by the name of Sting who is still doing it up to today, which we all know is... Not with the same apparatus. <laughs> yeah. Not with the same apparatus, and he hasn't, he hasn't done it, although he w- he did do it after Owen died, which I thought was in bad taste. He yeah. Hasn't done it I, in, probably this, in months. This I mean, is I haven't a real seen plan. Sting. I can't even remember the last time I've even seen that guy. Sting. I mean, even when Sting would come down from the rafters, I mean, you remember when he would take, like, 15 minutes to have to get all that stuff off him? Yeah, you know, right. And his heels would be attacking him, and he'd, like, put his foot up, and they'd all bump off it while he's trying to yeah, um, right. undo his uh, cable. His, his strap. His hook. So in, in, in any event, um, at one point in the interview, they start talking about Mushnick, and McMahon starts telling uh, Mike and the Mad Dog about how uh, Mushnick has his personal vendetta against him, and he sued him before, and he loved, he'd welcome another chance to sue him again, and you know, before you know it, Mushnick's on the line. 
So McMahon had told Mike and Amanda that he never met the man, that he had invited him up to his corporate offices, and he wanted to uh, to speak to him, but Mushnick didn't have the guts to face him. So you know, Mushnick, I have to say, came off terribly. I mean, he spends the first five minutes of the call arguing as to whether or not they ever met. Well, I spoke to you on the phone. Well, no, you didn't, Phil. We spoke for two minutes. Well, we never met. I didn't say that. I mean, who cares whether well, they, or not they, they ever never, met? They, they have never met, and they have spoke on the phone. I can't right. that. So, but, okay. but, but clearly, you know, Vince, Vince was letting much just, just ramble yeah. on on these issues that really didn't mean anything. So sure. Mike and the Mad Dog, you know, well, Phil, get to the point. What do you have against Vince McMahon? Well, he's a man that employs pedophiles. So he brings up the name. He mentioned it by name, Mel Phillips and Terry Garvin. And, you know, Vince So well, I mean, uh, if there was, in fact, a problem, there would have been a prosecution. And, you know, of course, he knew there there had been a problem. He just completely denied it. Well, I mean, they had a lawsuit settlement. You know, yeah. with Tom Cole, so. Yeah, he yeah. said, well, one of the gentlemen is dead, and the other one no longer works for us. But I, I thought it was sort of silly of Mushnick to bring these things up from, from you know, ancient history. Yeah, from eight, nine years ago. It made him right. look bad. You yeah. know, he lost credibility. So then he goes into, well, Vince, you've, you've also admitted that you use steroids. Uh, you claimed you used them when, you were le- when they were legal. So, you know, we've heard him make that argument. I'm sure you've heard it. So Vince says, well, that's right. So uh, Mushnick's counter is, so, you know, Mike and Amanda don't say, well, what's your point? The Mushnick's counter is, well, if they were legal, why is the doctor, why did Dr. Zahari do a stint in the federal pen? And, you know, Vince just pretty much blow it off, like, well, there's different standards for doctors and people purchasing them. And Mike and Amanda go like, Phil, do you have anything real here to say? So that's when he went into, well, let me tell you something. My 10-year-old daughter comes home in tears because she's called a hoe and a bitch and and he really came off very poorly, and then Vince pretty much just blew him off. And, and frankly, so did Mike in the Mad Dog. He didn't really make any valid points. I mean, he brought things up, but, but not, any, not anything that would really get your juices flowing. I mean, he, he, he could have been, I thought, a lot more on point with the, with the current product of the WWF, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, he, 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 was, he, got, he, he got very excited, and Vince was very calm. And, you know, he, he that's, just that's must have come off well. You can't make. Yeah, it just, it, but, but, but Vince, I thought... It was great on Mike and the Mad Dog. And did, did you guys have a chance to hear how it's turned today? Uh, no, I've only read transcripts. I thought that was that, that was pretty funny. Also, that came off pretty well. I mean, he's a pretty good interview when he wants to be. Um, he can be. He can be many different things. He could be pretty charming when he wants to be. Oh, absolutely. I, that's why I was so surprised with the Costas thing because he came off so poorly. Yeah, yeah. Well, he 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 mentioned to Mike and the Mad Dog that uh, you know he's a guy that. That was a little odd statement. He, he said, well, I'm a guy that likes confrontation, whether it be verbal or physical, which is a little bit of a weird thing to say to, to somebody, you know, on the air. But uh, he's, he's got this tough guy image. But in any event, his whole premise of being on the show was to continually repeat that the XFL was damn good football. And, you know, Mike and, and Chris are telling him, well, listen, if, if the NFL is, is good football or excellent football, the XFL isn't damn anything. It's, it's you know, it's a notch below. These are guys that can't make it. So Vince Spray basically said, well, we've got this guy Avery who was a first-round pick, and, and uh, Tommy Maddox is lighting it up, and we invite you to sit in the stands and watch a game and just give us another chance and that kind of thing. That was, that was, the, basic, that was the basic gist of it all. So, did, they bring, did, they bring, did they ask him how come the numbers dropped so much this week? Yeah, he, he said NC, NCAA tournament killed him, and, and he oh. pulled, he fully you know? expects. Well, it did. It did. It's 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 valid to it's valid to an extent. What about St. Patrick's Day? Did you mention that? No, he didn't mention that. But he Thank did mention the, the tournament, um, and he did uh, give the same spiel about how they didn't have enough training camp time to make it good football. But now it's they're you know they want people to revisit it because once you see what now what they're offering, uh, you know you'll be hooked. You know. Yeah. How come the attendance in, in almost every market, except for this one actually, San Francisco still does well, but in almost every market the attendance has dropped. So Vince had the nerve to say that they were week. they were. They were breaking attendance records, and that the fan experience <laughs> at the XFL games, from the feedback they were getting and the research attendance they were doing, records. was second to no other sporting event out there today. He said that they were averaging 35,000 people a game, and that uh, the people were showing up three hours late, uh, early to tailgate, and all of this. Yeah, Maybe that's 35,000 a game. You really said that, huh? Yeah, he said that. Unbelievable. So you know, he's, <laughs> he he says it, it's, it's very believable when you hear it. Yeah, but you know the thing is, is is like, you know, newspapers actually cover that stuff. Unlike yeah. with wrestling, where he can make his numbers up. Right. Newspapers actually cover that stuff, and it's like, and and the, and the newspaper reports. I mean, on on XFL, first of all, their attendance is about twenty. Their claimed attendance is twenty seven, and in so many of these markets, I mean, Chicago, L.A. in particular. I mean, the newspapers like laugh when the number comes out because they know that it's yeah. you know like 
They'll announce 7,000 people at 17. I, I can tell you in, in New York at the Meadowlands here uh, where the Hitmen play, there's, there's nobody there for those games. And the, the tickets are given out for free. I mean, we could, I could go into like Jiffy Lube and get two free tickets with an oil change. Well, what, does that tell, what does that tell you? In, in Vegas, I heard they had 7,800 paid at the last game, and they had about 17,000 in the building. I know yeah. uh, this market's very strong, but that's you know that's not even the XFL. That's Pac Bell Park. I mean, this has never been a strong baseball market. And the Giants are sold out for almost every single game next season. It's because the the ballpark is over. It's yeah. not so much. Although although the people who go here, I mean, they generally have a positive feeling towards it. You know, this is the aberration of a market. All the other markets are not doing. Yeah, doing yeah, very maybe well. Vince well. can blame the stadiums next. <laughs> yeah, <I'm not> over. <laughs> but uh, it was interesting this morning on Howard Stern. He did acknowledge the, w, the, the WCW deal. She, uh, Robin oh, yeah. Rivers had asked him point blank, "Are, are you uh, buying the other organization?" And he said yes. Which I, yeah. was, I thought the, the was deal may even be, the deal may already be done. He, he claimed that it was done, and she said, "Well, one more question: Will you be running this as a, uh, a separate organization, or will you just?" Uh, merge it all into WWF. And he said, well, I, I uh, suppose at this point the plan is to keep everything separate, whatever that means, you know. So that's the temporary thing. I mean, they'll, they'll keep it separate because they have to. I mean, I can tell you that the plan when they were going to buy it before was to keep the two things separate because they figured if they did the inner promotion yeah. that WCW was too weak to make it work, mm -hmm. so they didn't want to do it. But now the idea would be to rebuild WCW, then do the inner promotion. Unfortunately, once they do that, you know, there's, there's certain inevitability of, of how that plays out, yeah. too. But Dave, how will he rebuild WCW without any TV time on Turner? Well, he's going to have to get somewhere he's gonna, else. He's going to have to get TV on TNN or someplace. Oh, like I that. got you. I mean, there's no, you know, he's got, you know, I mean, the one thing he can do though is he can get another hour on TNN because, my God, like, you know, his shows kill everything else on that network. Yeah, for sure. He could use the XFL time slots. Yeah, I hate those commercials. <laughs> what is pop, guys? I love Crockett and Tubbs on Miami Vice. You ever hear that one? <laughs> I know I, I know those commercials. I'm not like Brian who fast forwards through the commercials when he watches Raw. <laughs> oh, it's awful. So that's, that's, that's about the story, and I just have to, as an aside, I have to tell Brian, uh, figure four, my favorite column ever was your review of the Heroes of Wrestling. I read it every week. It's absolutely hilarious. The same column every week? I, I can't stop. I can't okay. stop. My favorite was the year in review. That was one of the funniest articles. Yeah, oh, yeah, and God. I love the Observer. So, guys, uh, keep up oh, the good you. work. Somebody likes the Observer too. Oh, I gotta love the Observer. That's like oh. the Times. That's like the New York Times of wrestling. I'm sure you've heard that. Oh, well, well, I got you on the phone, Dave. A quick question about the Observer. Just out of curiosity, uh, I mean, if you if you don't want to disclose this, that's fine. But I always wonder. I mean, how many readers do you have? Is, is this uh, my part of a know. large group, or is it a? Because McMahon, they, you know, I've, I've heard him claim, well, you're talking about actually Vince Russo. It's a cult following that a couple of hundred people read. I mean, well, it's a lot more than a couple. It's, it's several thousand. But the, I mean, as far as how many readers, I don't know the pass along rate. Right. I mean, but I would think that with pass along, it'd be, you know, ten, fifteen thousand readers. Yeah, realistically, right. I would think. I don't, but I don't know. I mean, I know WWF. What do they claim in their magazine, or, or what have they claimed that like oh. every issue of WWF ends up being read by twenty-two people? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Well, okay. Some, uh, some ridiculous lot. number. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Let's go to some emails. Uh, what is the worst WrestleMania in your opinion ever? God, four and five, and the Vegas one. I forget what number Vegas was. Those were nine. the three worst. The nine. Is that the one with uh, were... Brett and Hogan, Yokozuna? Uh, uh, and Yokozuna, yeah. Yeah, nine. Those were the bad ones. I think. Um... Uh, let's see. I think four, four and five. Well, the one with well, the one with Roddy Piper and Morton Downey. That was horrid. <laughs> okay, the best. Uh, ninety four, maybe was the best. Yeah, WrestleMania ten. So it's ninety four, and maybe what ninety eight was pretty good. Does that sound right? Ninety nine was wasn't that good. This year's uh, will probably be up there. Oh, ninety seven was very good, but ni I think ninety four would be the best. Mm -hmm. But it's only been. The thing with 94 was it was really two good matches and everything else stunk. Yeah. I mean, like two not two good matches, two incredible matches and everything else stunk, whereas other years there have been more good matches. And the best, okay, see, if you guys could have changed one thing WCW did, what would it have been? This is my answer. That they had done that marketing survey that they did 18 months earlier and then listened to it. Yeah. Uh, you got any ideas? That's as far as like, a good one. Okay. Kamala has been added to the WWF Battle Royal on April Fool's Day. I wonder if it's... God, I, that, that, the original Kamala, I haven't seen him in years. Oh, golly. Let's see what else we got. Um, 
I listened to Vince on Stern. It was quite entertaining. Obviously, Howard and Robin knew next to nothing about wrestling. But what was sad was they had a fan come on and ask questions. The only person on the show asked smart questions about Heyman, dropped his pants to Vince and Howard to show him that, in fact, he had two assholes. you got to love wrestling fans. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, this goes. Um, if you haven't already, this is to Brian. Get your money back. I run a small publishing house, and whenever they screw up like that with me, they always offer to send it out for free. If they haven't, or if you haven't demand, they send it out for free because they screwed up. Well, unfortunately, they were all already stamped and everything, so. <laughs> uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. What do you think about Linda firing Vince from the WWF? I don't know. They can do any story they want. And then he goes to WCW to compete against Linda. Well, it's possible. Hey, anything's possible. Um, what is your opinion of Colonel De Beers? He was just a wrestler. Uh, had a kind of a, you know, uh, decent when he was younger. Had a very controversial gimmick. Why well, never went to WF or NWA? Because he had a very controversial gimmick. Uh, I know you were predisposed to think that McMahon may have been in the wrong and not Mushnick. I didn't, listen, I couldn't tell you that, but Mushnick was way off base and came off really bad. I hear you defending Mushnick on the show, but Mushnick came off rambling trying to debate points from 10 years ago. It came across as a vendetta. Uh, you know, i got to mention that we didn't talk about uh, Thunder too much last night, but I was just thinking about this. Actually, we should. The um, show ended. And they talk about it just being the season finale and all this and that, after like 29 years or whatever. And then they cut to a shot of like, I think it was the production crew, because yeah, I didn't recognize anybody. And they're all sitting there on the ramp, and there's this little this little thing on the bottom that says, thanks. And yeah. I'm sitting here watching this, and uh, luckily I had it on tape so I could rewind it, but it's like, there's all these guys sitting there, and like one guy starts to get up, and it's like someone yells, sit down, we're going to film right now, and he sits back down. And some guys are, like, looking off on the side. And I thought to myself, you know, this is like the ultimate. they got that production crew sitting here. And uh, you can't get one ten-second clip of them all sitting together and waving goodbye at the same time. Is it really that hard? And right then I just thought, this is so pathetic. What is You know, when I was watching that show last night, it was just like, I, 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 you know, and there were, there was some good wrestling last night. Um, you know, the cruiserweights had some good matches. Uh, Kid Cash and um, Jason... Jet had a good match, and some of the stuff wasn't that, you know. But I'm watching it, and it was like, I mean, it was actually surreal to watch this, because it's like, here's this, the final, sh this is the final show ever on that station, after 29 years, and they're just doing this wrestling show, oblivious to the fact that, you know, and building up angles for the future, you know, and just like running it like it's a wrestling show without, and the announcer's just announcing it like, oh, you know, and don't forget the season finale, not explaining to anyone what's going on, and you got to figure a good percentage of the audience has at least read because this story is made newspapers and like uh, that the, the, the show's canceled. Yeah. And they're just like working this angle, season finale, no one knows what it means. And it's like to the very end. To the very end. I'll tell you something about this company. And you'll see it in the uh, in the observer when it comes out, or those of you, you know, who have seen on the internet the memo. I mean I'm just thinking like to the bitter end, you've got all of these wrestlers who have no idea what's going on, have been kept in the dark. You have that memo that went out on Friday, where they're telling everyone there's a hiatus, and then two hours later, TBS, you know, why don't they just say in the memo, you know, what's going on, and instead, two hours later, after being told it's a hiatus, you know, all of a sudden you get the word that um, it's all canceled, and you're losing your job, and it's like, God, you know, I, 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 I just, I couldn't believe it. You know, you have Mike, Tony Schiavone, who's been, you know, not consecutively, because he had the run with WWF, but he's been with the company... And on CBS since, God, when, 1985? Mm -hmm. I, I think when, when, when Crockett took over, so it would be 1985. So, and he's just out there just announcing it like it's a wrestling show. And I think the only thing he said was, like, what a run here on Thunder. It was like, yeah. Thunder? Yeah. This is from Chris in Minnesota. Isn't McMahon's big break his opponents? Like Bill Clinton, his opponents come off so vehement that they come off as insane and pump McMahon is honest and full of integrity. Other than Costas, McMahon plays very clean, and his opponents do not. That leads WF fans to buy McMahon's arguments, regardless of the validity of his points. Okay. Hey, guys. It's actually, yes. I just wanted to jump on real quick. We'll have Rico Constantino in a minute. But, however, on hold is Tom Cole, who we had on the show uh, about a month ago, and uh, has an interesting to story to tell about getting on uh, with, uh, um, with Vince McMahon today at WFAN, okay? Oh, okay. Tom, what's going on? Hey, Dave. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Good, good. Uh, actually, let me just uh, start from the beginning. Uh, I work in the city, so this morning I stopped by the Stern Show, 
And uh, I wanted to I wanted to talk to McMahon. I wanted to approach him and ask him about things that I've heard about him telling people that what I said was untrue, my allegations of being molested by Mel Phillips. And uh, you should have seen the expression on his face because he hasn't seen me in years. And I said, how you doing, uh, uh, Mr. McMahon? And he looks at me, and he had no idea who I, at, who I was. He goes, how you doing, sir? I said, I'm, you don't remember me, do you? He goes, no. I said, I'm Tom Cole. If you could have seen his face drop to the floor, and uh, I wanted to, I said, I want to talk to you about you, you know, you know, call me a liar and things like that. And he, uh, he walked, he like totally walked away from me. He just walked in the building so fast. And I heard he was just on uh, WFAN here in New York with uh, Phil Mushnick got on. And Phil Mushnick really gave him a going over. And uh, McMahon had said uh, he, he got him on the Mel Phillips thing. And he, he you know, he just totally danced around the, the issues with the steroids, with Mel Phillips in particular, saying that uh, he never had a child molester working for him. Mel never really worked for him. And that, uh, and I'm trying to get through like crazy. He's like, Mel, ne Mel never worked for me. You know, he, he was uh, outside uh, help. You know, you know how he, he was, said that he in the He was a ring announcer and ring crew guy for a hundred years. Oh, for, for the longest, it was just disgusting. And and, and uh, so he danced around that issue, and then he got him. And then Musick asked him about the steroids, and he ever took illegal steroids. He says, "I took them when they weren't legal." He says, "Then why did your doctor go to jail for prescribing them if he if they weren't if they weren't illegal?" And he says, "Yeah, he went to jail, but I didn't go to jail." He goes, "Yeah, but you were getting." Drugs illegally, which is true. I mean, if you go to your Technic doctor, technically he would have been getting them illegally because the guy who supplied him went to jail. Yes. Yeah, and I'm trying but to get not, like, but what McMahon, but what, but, Mc, but McMahon by taking them was not doing anything illegal. Oh, at, uh, at that point, at that point in time, up through '91. Now, you know, since '91, the law has changed and it would be a felony. Well, he but, had asked him. Well, if you didn't feel that taking these drugs were was illegal, if, if you thought it wasn't illegal, then why did you have them shipped to a, a private box? You didn't pick them up yourself. You didn't go get them from a pharmacy. You were very shady in the way that you got these things. If you oh, were... oh, 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 and then in the, the duplicitous checks and things? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, they like kind of like... Yeah, hit it. There's, it actually, wasn't... there's yeah. actually a story about that where um, when it came to, I remember at the trial, that, that they would send a check... That would be. It wasn't impossible to trace because the feds traced it pretty easily. But it wasn't like it was a check Vince McMahon would write to um, uh, Zahorian. It would be like a check that was sent to someone who would then send it, and then they would get another check. So it was, yep. you know, clearly by the nature of how he did it. I mean, he was obviously trying to hide the fact that he was purchasing. Yeah, again, Dan. But, I, but and actually, I can understand that too because I'm sure that a lot of the smart wrestlers, as opposed to the dumb ones, probably should have handled it the same way because. If there is a bust, you know, you certainly don't want to check with your name on it in his account. So anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, but I tried to get on to WFAN, and it was so hard to get through because it was busy, busy, busy. And he, you know, when he was talking this stuff about Mel Phillips and saying the allegations, they really weren't true. And he wouldn't bring, he wouldn't specifically bring my name up, but he was saying they weren't true. So I tried to get through the, the studio, and I couldn't. So I called the front office. They put me through to some special, you know, line that they have through the producer. And I'm telling them, you know, who I am, and they said they have to verify it. Then they call, I called them back again, like 15 minutes later, and I'm like, listen, this is who I am. I'm trying to get through. So by that time, Mc, Phil Mushik had already hung up, and McMahon was just like getting ready to leave the studio. And you can hear, like, they went to a break, and you can hear Mike and the, I think it was the Mad Dog going through the stu, through the studio. You can hear him in the background, and you can hear McMahon talking to him. I guess they must have been getting autographs or something like that, you know, after you have you know somebody like that on your show you make small talk with him i guess and maybe cut a couple promos or something and you could hear mcmahon in the background talking to him and i'm telling him well put mcmahon on the phone with me if he wants to call me a liar and mcmahon you know he he goes the guy's like hold you know the producer says hold on a second and he puts me on hold and he comes back on you could hear someone in the background talking to mcmahon saying hang up on him and then i, I was like you're gonna hang up on me and the guy's like uh, he goes, I'll try to get you on in the future. I was like, that's ridiculous. Why wouldn't you put me on now? And you could tell as someone was again saying to him, hang up the phone. And, 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 and again, I'm like, well, if you want to put me on in the future, how much sense does that make? Uh, you know, you have the hot topic right now. You're going to tell me to call back in the future? How much sense does that make? And the guy just hung up on me. But someone was pulling this guy's strings. It's just unbelievable. You know, I'm, no. the, guy, I'm the guy who he's, he's, he's saying is lying, but he, he won't get on with me. He has a forum. Like, I, I don't have a forum like this guy, and it's just, 
you know, it eats me up because I'm older now and, and everything else, but, you know, it, 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 you, I mean, we all know what, what happened with me and with other people, but this guy, he got away with McMahon by the skin of his teeth, and he, he walked the fine line, and now he's saying it's not true because he knows what am I going to do. I mean, I don't have a forum like this. He could say, no, it never happened, and who, how could Tom Cole come forward and say it does? I don't have a, a soapbox to get on. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just, it's crazy. Mm. I, I think I had just heard you say, you were saying something similar to that about other things with, with him, being able to finagle around things. I mean, the guy, it, it's just unbelievable. It, it really is. And then they were like sucking up to him after he left, kind of. The guy's mm -hmm. a charmer, there's no doubt about that. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Even Howard, he had Howard eating out of his hand. I don't know if you heard the show or not. I just read the transcript, but yeah. you know, there was no, there was no real, uh, you know, no real confrontation. What I was surprised was when, and I, and again, not having heard the show, was with Howard, when Howard was bringing up his idea, and, you know, of, of, um, basically trying to turn the XFL into Survivor, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is entirely against, you know, the sport idea, and then Vince goes, that's a good idea. You know, someone on this show, okay, if someone on this show would call up and go, I got this idea to save the XFL, and would have said that, I would have said, that's a stupid idea. But Vince was like, I guess because of Howard, you know, it's like, that's a great idea. Okay, Vince didn't do it next year. Come on. That yeah, but, idea was, that idea was so stupid. Anyway, sorry, sorry. Yeah, he's just, you know, he's obviously just, you know, you know, stroking his ego. He probably was, you know, in the, in the back of his mind thinking that was stupid because, I, I mean, realistically. He, he didn't want to start another fight. It wouldn't be that's football. <laughs> I mean, how would it be football? I mean, it, you know, it, it, it is a pretty stupid idea. But I'm, I don't know if you remember when I was on the show, I said, I give it a year and a half. And, you know, I, I think I, I, I actually might turn out to either be right or I, I might be off by six months. Six months meaning six months it's not going to last six months, a year. Either, six months either way, you'll be off, yeah. It'll, yeah. Either be one, it'll either be one year or two years. I'm pretty sure of that, too. Unless it's, unless there's just, you know, unless McMahon keeps it going just to keep it going, just to, to prove, you know, to prove he can. But from a business standpoint, from a pure business standpoint, you wouldn't want to do a second year. There's there's absolutely no logic to doing a second year. Dave, but I don't want to sound wacky. You know, a lot of people, they might find this as sounding wacky, but here's what I want to do. I'm going to pay for it out of my own pocket. I'm going to hire, a, and, and, and I know that any time I'm on something, any type of show, that they automatically in the WWF get, they, they somehow get a transcript of it or they find out. Believe me, I know this for a fact. Um, I want to issue a challenge to Vince. Um, he says that this, what I said wasn't true and things like that. I will pay for it out of my own pocket. I will hire an independent lie detector test company. And I will take a lie detector test. And I challenge him to do the same. It might sound insane, but I, I challenge he might, him. He might, he might beat it. He, he may, I mean, I don't know. Maybe he won't. I, but you know, it's like, it's like he's... He's a he, damn some, good liar. Some, sometimes when you, when you... You know, you, you can, after 10 years, convince yourself of something and, and, and actually believe it, even if it's not the case. Or, I, I, I really... The, the yeah, guy, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't sat know. in rooms with the guy. I, I know what the guy has said to me in the past. Maybe he could, you know, theoretically say, I, I, I didn't believe that it was happening. But, you know, it will be a little different. I, I, I sincerely, uh, they could get this, I, a transcript or something. I hope they could hear this show somehow. And take me up on that offer. I, I swear, man, because this is just, it's out of hand. It, it, it's really disgusting. And it, the, the, the way, you gotta get a copy of the, of the, the show with Mushnik on it, because it was really, really good. I mean, for the 15 minutes that they were on there with each other, and I thought Mushnik gave him a really, made a really good accounting of himself, because he really, uh, laced into him, and he really had, for the first time, I can actually say, like, McMahon was, like, kind of dumbstruck. He was trying to say he never, you know, met uh, Phil or he never spoke to Phil. And then Phil says, you've spoken to me at least a dozen times. He goes, I, I never spoke to you, or maybe, uh, maybe four or five times. It went from not speaking to him maybe once to four or five times. Uh, um, I hope I get a tape of this. He thing says, I, I haven't know. spoken to you in a really long time, uh, Phil. Sure that's true. I spoke to you a year ago, Vince. Oh, well, uh, I did, and then he goes, I, <laughs> Vince says, oh, yeah, I did speak to you a year ago, uh, but I always ask you, come up to my office, meet with me, let me show you uh, what kind of business I run and how, you know, I'm not, you know, trying to put something over on you and things like that. He would love to have, to do to Phil what he's done to every 
almost every other person, and that is to charm them, get them up there, maybe offer them some type of job or pay off or whatever he does. That, that's what he would love to do, but um, thank God it, it, I don't think it would happen with Phil. And that's why I even said the last time on your show that I consider the guy, you, you know, the guy is like a hero to me because he doesn't do that. And I've seen so many people from so many walks of uh, journalistic life go in, meet with this guy, and just totally change their character, change their stories, drop things, and just, you know, act as if they never met you. So it, it, it says a lot about Mushnick's character, I can tell you that much. But I just Tom, thought, we, Tom, Tom, we actually got to get running right now because yep. we're, we're on a commercial break. Tom, thanks for calling. You're okay? welcome. Take care. Okay. Rico, how are you today? Good. How about yourself? Oh, it's been quite a day. <laughs> I guess I've heard. Yes, you have. You picked a great day to come on. I mean, uh, WCW is on the verge of being completely sold, and uh, Vince McMahon's been all over the radio. And <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I'm at a loss. My day starts at like 6.30 a.m., go to the gym, then we got to go practice, and then and then towards the end of the day, I, I get to come home and eat and cook and that kind of stuff, and then, my goodness, I've missed a whole day. <laughs> Boy, did I miss a day. Oh my God! What's your thoughts as far as um and, and does it affect you? Has anyone, has anyone talked about like the um, you know Vince McMahon buying WCW and how it affects all you guys in Ohio Valley? It hasn't even been brought up yet to me. I mean, like I said, it's I'm at I had a loss. I didn't know what was going on today. It started the day at 6:30 and I leave the house and that's my day. I just got back in about an hour ago. So now, now, now with you, for, for people who don't know, um, you've been wrestling for a, a couple of years, uh, WF developmental guy, uh, wrestling in Ohio Valley, current OVW champion. Yes. And, uh, wrestled as a baby face, um, for a long time, injured your knee, came back, did the turn, and actually probably been doing much better than ever before. Oh, thank you. Um, kind of with a, um, you know, just, uh, what, kind of, kind of the main man fact, uh, on the, on the big show in Louisville, January 30th, you got a confrontation with Steve Austin. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty big. That's, how, how, was, how was working with Steve Austin, like the number one guy, number two guy in the industry, you know, for you? Wow. Geez, no words can describe it. I mean, I was, I was just told to do something, and I went out there and worked with Steve, and he's great. He was great to work with. You know, easy going. Um, just uh, what you see is what you get from Steve, you know. And uh, went out there and just looked him in his eye. I mean, it's kind of intimidating at first, me being, you know, like I said only a couple of years in the business, and him being, like you said, number one, number two guy. It was kind of intimidating at first, but once I got in there, it was just, just be me. What's uh, what's your feeling on on the various different guys that are in Ohio Valley? Who who do you think's got the best shot at at making it? You know, of uh, the guys that you're working with, and who do you enjoy working with the most that's down there? My gosh, I mean, the athletes that are in Ohio Valley now, I mean, my gosh, what a roster. Come from, like, Brock Lesnar, Shelton Benjamin, uh, you know, the NC2A champ in wrestling. You got uh, uh, Sylvester, Turkey, you know, Big Bear, mm -hmm. um, um, Russ McCullough. Uh, what's up with Russ McCullough? Somebody actually sent in an email before the show and said, what's is, is, he, is he injured or is he around? I believe it's, his shoulder's injured at this time. Okay, that, okay, that's what it's okay. Yeah, his shoulder. And, uh, I mean, it's anybody's game to go. I mean, everybody works very hard. I like working with everybody on the roster because everybody has a real great attitude. Um, people I have fun with the best are Flash, Rob Conway, Nick Dinsmore, you know, stuff like that. I mean, I have real good matches with those guys. And now and being the heel, you know, and their, their faces right now. I mean, not, not so much Rob Conway, but uh, when I was a face, Rob was a heel. We had, I mean, we had some go rounds. What's um? I mean, when you when you came back, was it was Jim Cornette's idea for you to go in the other direction, or did you want to try it? And had you ever done it before? Because I, I don't. Have no. you ever done it before anywhere? No, you no, never. I, I started an Empire Wrestling Federation in California. Jesse Hernandez, a school of hard knocks down in San Bernardino, and I came out with you know the American Gladiator theme because I had you know won the American Gladiators, and I was a I was a baby then, and then. Uh, uh, came here to Ohio Valley, hit the ground running there, and I'd been, I was a baby then, and then, and I was talking to, uh, Danny and Jim about saying, you know, I'd like to go, and they said, well, no, nah, you, you have to look for this, you have to look for that, and they kept postponing it, and then, um, when I got injured, you know, I tore the quad tendon on my right kneecap, completely tore in half, 
got that fixed and came back and I was in the ring with Flash at the time when I got hurt and uh, when I was coming back, Flash kind of like turned into a baby. And so we just decided to put Flash and I against each other and he was, you know, getting popped. So they said, well, why don't you try this? And I was all up for it. How are you doing physically since coming back? Oh, physically, I'm, I'm back. I had, I had some great therapists, great doctor. First they told me I'd be out eight months to a year and... Uh, I didn't like that, and uh, I was doing physical therapy five days a week in Las Vegas, and uh, came back in four and a half months. Mm -hmm. Wow! But no so, lingering so... problems or anything like that. No, no. I mean, I, I, I'm smart. I wear uh, one of the Don Joys on my right leg, mm -hmm. the same brace as Stone Cold wears. Oh, um, as far as far as um, you know, a lot, what a lot of people may not know about you, the, the very interesting. There's a lot of interesting stories about your background um, <laughs> in between the American Gladiators. Police work and everything like that, <laughs> um, bodybuilding and everything. Um, but the the real interesting thing with you, and you mentioned this when uh, when you, we were on together a couple months ago, is that um, you were you were at a camp with Dory Funk Jr. Yeah. And they were kind of questioning everybody about their background, their age, and all this. And you know, um, so Dory Funk Jr. comes to you and goes, "What's your age?" And this is like you're breaking in at, 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 this, at the thing. And I'm at WWF. I'm at Titan Towers. This is camp. This is my tryout. Right. And uh, Dory had talked to like three or four people ahead of me, and he spent about two, two and a half minutes with each person, you know, talking to them, getting some background. And Dory sat in front of me, and he goes, well, what's your name? I told him my name. He goes, how old are you? I looked down. I said, 37. He looked at his wife, looked at me. And he fi I guess he was figuring in his head, oh, he's been in the business a while. He says, uh, so how long have you been in the business? I said, eight months. He stood up and walked away. <laughs> I had about 15 seconds with Dory. That was my introduction to camp. I was like, oh, no. Now, now did you, how did you get the de developmental deal? Hmm. Well, I was wrestling, like I said, for Empire Wrestling Federation in California. And it's kind of funny. Jesse Hernandez is a promoter. And when WWF comes to Anaheim or Los Angeles, he, they would call Jesse for extras, you know, for workers, you know, for, for dark matches or whatever. And um, I guess Bruce, he, well, this is what Jesse thought. Bruce Pritchard did talk to um, Jesse and ask for about five or six people. This is when they were going through the cane, uh, was going to get put in a mental asylum, and he wanted, mm -hmm. like, the medical people dressed in white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, well, that was about that time. And I guess Bruce said, we're going to go be in Anaheim, and uh, we need a couple of your guys to play some medical people. Well, Jesse said, okay, um, I'll do that for you, but you got to take a look at my guy. Take a look at Rico. And, and uh, the guy said on the phone, you know, she thought it was Bruce. He said, yeah, send me a tape. Jesse says, who do I send it to? And Bruce said, send it right to me, WWF. So he called me in Vegas, said, get a tape ready about five minutes and ship it to this address. I said, okay. So I shipped it to the address, this little promo tape, and I had little gladiators on it, little power team, little French version of gladiators and some wrestling. And I waited about three, four weeks, and then I went to wrestle in Victorville, and Jesse came up and he says, hey, I want to talk to you. And I said, okay. He says, I don't know how to tell you this, but I got ribbed. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, somebody's playing a joke on me. That wasn't Bruce Pritchard on the phone when I told him about you. And I said, really? He goes, yeah. And I said, well, what are we going to do? I sent a tape to Bruce Pritchard at WWF. <laughs> he says, well, I don't know what to say, brother. So I just waited. And I had a friend of mine call up like a week later to WWF, and he lives in New York. His name's Steve DeLeo. And he called Bruce Pritchard and said, listen, I'm talk I want to check about my guy, Rico Costantino. And Bruce told my friend, he said, well, it's funny. I have his tape in my hand. I'm going to look at it tonight. Uh, Jim Cornette just handed me the tape, and he says, you need to take a look at this kid. And he told my friend, uh, okay, I'll give you a call next week. And uh, that was uh, Wednesday. Well, Thursday, the phone was ringing, and it was Howard Finkel on the phone asking me to be at camp at a certain time in April. And I said, okay. And then I shipped off in April, and I signed my contract in May. So realistically, because they get so many tapes, both solicited and unsolicited, uh, you probably did, did someone like alert Jim Cornette to watch the tape because I mean I know Jim Cornette gets tapes of people that, that he doesn't watch every single one of them I have a feeling well I, I believe at the time because I asked 
Cornette, you know, how'd you know find my tape? I guess Bruce had handed him a bunch of tapes, yeah. and uh, Cornette saw, you know, like I said, I had a little bit of American Gladiators on there. Uh, are you familiar with the Power Team? That's, that's the Christian thing, right? Yes. They break the demonstrations? Bricks. I mean, a little bit, not... Okay, yeah, go, explain bolts, a little break bit, though, yeah. handcuffs. I put about two minutes of that, of the stuff I did there, and then about five minutes of highlight wrestling. And I, he says, uh, when he saw me, my, me put my head through about two feet of concrete on fire, <laughs> I jumped up to him and said, hey, take a look at this guy. We can do something with him. And um, that's, I guess, why he handed it to Bruce. And Bruce looked at the tape, and instead of giving you know, a week, he called the next day. And Howard was asking me to be in camp. That's how I got to camp. And I didn't know Cornette at the time. I didn't know anybody at the time. You know, and went to camp, and in the last two days of camp, uh, we did, uh, you know, spot shows for Killer Kowalski. And uh, my first match was Cornette was managing Mark Henry, and it was me against Mark. So I got introduced to the racket real quick. <laughs> and then we were the next show, and I was in a tag match. And uh, after that tag match, we came back, and Cornette <laughs> said, Get over here, you! And I was like, Oh, my gosh, did I goof up? And he says, They just told me how old you were. Is this true? And I said, I don't know. How old did they tell you? He said, 37. <laughs> I said, Yeah. He said, you genetic freak, get out of my face. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, he says, listen, um, if they sign you, I'll take you. I know a guy named Danny Davis. I'm going to be going down to Ohio Valley Wrestling in uh, July. He says, give me a month to get set up, and then I'll call you if they sign you. And I said, okay. And at that point, it was just discussing, waiting for Bruce to approach me and stuff like that. And they did, and I signed the contract in, in May, and... Uh, Jimmy went there at the end of June, beginning of July. At the end of July, Jimmy called me. I flew out here. First match was the Gardens. Next match was TV. He says, we want you out here. I drove out from Vegas. Uh, August 3rd, I was here, and that's when I started. Do you uh, look at, I mean, are you, do you really, are you enjoying your stay a lot as a pro wrestler? I love it. I mean, I've done a lot of things in my life, and I, I love this business. I mean, I eat, sleep, and breathe it. I watch tapes all the time. I'm on, I watch TV. I just love this business. Does he give you pop quizzes on, like, history and stuff? Hmm? Does Cornick, like, give you guys, like, quizzes on, like, history of wrestling and stuff? He gives us information <laughs> pamphlets all the time on the history of wrestling. <laughs> I mean, we got, some, you know, reading material. He gives us Reading tapes, material. He does. <laughs> and you have to watch Jackie Fargo tapes, right? <laughs> <laughs> we watch everybody. Midnight Express, Rock Roll Express, <laughs> Flair, Wyndham, you name it. Tomorrow it's, uh, I believe it's rock and angle tomorrow. Oh, well, they had a lot of great matches. I oh. give them. <laughs> now, do you, do you, um, I guess you probably do, like, wish that you had, like, somehow stumbled into this, like, 10, 12 years earlier? I, I wish I did, but I don't, I guess it's timing. And how I got, Mick, got brought into the business was a, another thing. I was helping some other guy drive the distance from Las Vegas, three and a half hours to San Bernardino. This guy was 6'9. 385. He wanted to be the pro wrestler. I didn't. And I was just didn't want him driving alone. You know, you drive three and a half hours there, work out for three hours, and drive three and a half hours back. You know, and he was an employee at the time. See, I was a manager of a bail bonds agency. And, uh, I, you know, he usually traveled with somebody. Well, one time he didn't have nobody to go with, and he asked me if I would go, and I said, all right. So after a day's work, about 3 o'clock, we took off. And uh, Jesse Hernandez said, hey, you know, why don't you get in the ring? I said, no. Nah. I came back with him another time, and he said, get in the ring. I said, no. No, I'm not, I'm I'm a man, general manager of a big business, and da, 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 I'm real busy. And then Jesse figured out the third time I showed up, he says, "Hey, can you do this?" And you don't ask me if I can do something because I'll go do it. And I did it. And he says, "Well, can you do this?" And I did it. And he says, "Can I do this?" And I did it. And he says, "You know what? I got to train you." And then that's how it started. Now, did did, did Cornette ever have you watch tapes of uh, Rick Martel? No, I haven't got any training tapes of Rick Martel yet. But okay. I know who he just, is. I used to watch the model all the time. Yeah, just because when whenever like we talk about you, the the two names that always pop up is kind of like as a heel. I I kind of see you from the recent heel stuff as a cross between like a, a Rick Martel character and Kurt Angle. <laughs> uh, I I got told that two days ago. Really, the model. <laughs> I, I, it's flattering to me. I just you know because I I like Rick Martel. I used to like his work. Back when I used to what, watch uh, do you have any kind of a main events and stuff like that. What kind of a timetable do you have you given yourself as far as as for the business where you want to be, how much time you're gonna go for it, uh, or or is it just like you're, you're just enjoying it, you're just gonna go as long as you can do it? Well, well, to be honest, you know, I got age, you know, 
I get you know I'm running around here with twenty year olds, and I have a son that's twenty years old. So wow. uh, I have to I have to be realistic. I have a wife, and I have two children, and I have to be realistic about it. You know, being here. And being gone from my family a lot, it does take a lot out of it. It does take a strong relationship to, to, survive, to survive that and go home every 30, 37 days, you know, only for like three or four days and come back and then get right back in the thing. I've given myself a couple of years, so I'm almost, I'm almost up. Wow. Um, yeah. How do you feel it's, I mean, how do you feel it's going? I mean, you're, I, I mean to me, I think your progression's been, been really strong. Well, I've had tremendous help from the guys in OVW, uh, all the, all the talent rosters. I mean, we all help each other. And if it wasn't for Danny's guys, uh, the guys I mentioned, like I said, Flash, Nick, Conway, Damager, Chris Alexander, these people that that took time to you know, I was like a sponge. Teach me, teach me, teach me. And I and I didn't care what they said. I took all the constructive criticism they had between Danny and Jim and all his guys. And now the new WWF talent coming in. I mean. I have to give the credit to them too because they've helped me, and I wouldn't be where I where I'm at now if it wasn't for those guys and Danny and Jimmy. Are there any of the guys in camp that maybe aren't there anymore who um, you felt like I don't know, like from an attitude standpoint, or why they didn't make it? Maybe I mean, you know, I'll even bring up like the name like Dave Nelson because he was so physically impressive, but yet I just remember I would watch him on tape, and every time he would go in there to do a job, I knew he was doing a job beforehand because I could read it in his face. I mean, were there, I mean, did you have any, uh, when you're looking at the guys, like some of the guys who came there, like, uh, after you and, and didn't quite make the grade, but maybe had the physical ability, do you think that was just, I mean, what do you think, like, they were missing, um, mm -hmm. in, as far as, like, uh, you know, being able to make the grade? Well, Dave Nelson was kind of rough. I, I was here when Dave Nelson first started. He had a great work habit in the beginning when I was here. Uh, he always would ask for help, and we'd come in on Saturdays and, and work out, and then I got hurt. And I was gone for the four and a half months, and then when I got back, he was already gone. So I missed four and a half months, and I really didn't know what happened being in Las Vegas. You know what I'm saying? But he was physically impressive. Oh, he was just a monster. Oh, oof, strong, too. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, like I said, I, I missed what happened in between that, so I don't know what the progression was with, with his demise, basically. Uh, I remember one other person with her, Stephen Gamblin, was there. Right. And, and he was gone. Another guy named Dave Cowan. He's there and gone. You know, it's just, you know, I've got two cheeks to look after, and as long as my two cheeks are in line, that's about the way I do things, you know. I, I just make sure I do what's expected and, and try to help when I ask for help and, and just try to do everything to the best of my ability at 120%. Uh, let me see what we have here. Let me go through some of this. This is, mentions that uh, we got Reba Constantino here. we got a full bank of phone calls, tons of emails. I just want to run through some of the emails real quick. Uh, this is Tony Schiavone started, started out as localized promo guy for Crockett in mid-83, and he did interviews the first star case, so he's been there for 18 years, more or less. I knew that Schiavone had been there, but um, Crockett didn't get the Superstation until 85, so Schiavone would have started on TBS in 85. But, um, yeah, I know he'd been around since 83. This is from Paul in Buffalo, who mentions that something people may have missed on the Stern Show. Howard brought up the issue of turning a profit on pay-per-view. He said that you really only get to keep 50 cents on the dollar. Actually, it's 40 cents on the dollar because of... In demand in the pay and the cable companies, Howard said to Vince something to the effect of somebody should do something about these guys. Vince replied, "We're looking into that." Um, interesting when you consider in demand's money woes. In fact, Vince will soon own or control all three wrestling companies that run pay per view. Well, first of all, ECW is not going to. Well, I shouldn't say for sure, but I don't think that ECW will be running any pay per views um, or, or existing, except as a, a name that they use uh, for angles. Uh, they may run WCW pay per views. It wouldn't surprise me that they do for a little while. Uh, not for the long term, and um, but as far as uh, Vince McMahon wanting to get rid of in demand, I'm I'm sure, I'm sure he does, uh, and uh, a lot of people do. Uh, there's a lot of people in wrestling really upset with in demand. Uh, what do you think would happen if Vince like uh, ran WCW as a separate organization and it got really big, and he had to make the choice of doing an interpromotional angle, making a ton of money in the short term, and then killing off the other profitable company, or just not doing it. I don't. I mean, you know, they they can make the decisions as time goes. Yeah. Um, I mean, that is etched in stone. They call their own storylines. Uh, let's see. If WF wrestlers were active and serious about forming a union, uh, don't even think about a union this week. <laughs> you, there's so many scared wrestlers that I've talked to in the last week. If there was a chance to get a union, it was two years ago, and uh, it's not a good chance right now. 
Uh, let's see. This is from Mike Russo, who goes, who's no relation to Vince or Chris. After reading your post on the Wrestling Observer website, it's quite obvious why WCW failed. The attitude of both Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan shows, that they, shows how much they care about the business and the company that made them millionaires. Their legacy will be remembered as one of greed, contempt for the wrestling public, and for the business which made them stars. I can only hope that this spend, spells the end for both of their careers for good. Well, it will not happen. Hulk Hogan will always be there. I don't know how or why, but he'll always be there, and so will Kevin Nash. But, um, yeah, I, we didn't even talk about this, but they asked um, Hulk Hogan, Sting, Kevin Nash, and Bill Goldberg to come to Nitro on Monday. I don't know if Sting and Goldberg will or won't be coming. Hogan turned them down. Although Hogan's got a lawsuit out against the company, so I can understand that. And Nash just said that uh, he's busy. He's he's staying with his kid. <laughs> so, I mean, he gets paid, let's see, 30, 30-something thousand dollars. No, what, I, let me do the math right. $30,000 a week. Roughly, actually a little bit more, about thirty, thirty-three thousand dollars a week. Hasn't been on for a while, and what well, was well, over a month? It's February pay-per-view was when he when he was last on. They asked him to come back for one final show, and he just goes, "Nah, I'm staying with my kid. I can't come in for one day." Thirty-three. So he's made one hundred and fifty thousand dollars roughly since the, his last appearance. Interesting economics there. Uh, let's see. Uh. There are, okay, let me see. Uh, in the future, if Mr. Cole needs to vent, tell him to call psychology today. Actually, I thought his story was very interesting, um, especially if they said that it wasn't true. Uh, and I, again, I didn't hear the, I didn't hear the, um, I didn't hear what Vince did or didn't say. So I don't want to comment on Vince McMahon. But if he did say that the story wasn't true, I think that the guy who knows the story is true calling is pretty good. Um, let's see, for those of us who don't know the story, can you bring us up to speed on the whole pedophile issue and who the guy was that called in? It's so long. I don't know. It's, it's a story from 10 years ago, but here it goes. Um, Tom Cole was working as a ring boy for the World Wrestling Federation, and um, while he was very, very young, I think from the age of 13 to about 19, setting up the rings, and had, you know, as he was on the show, claimed that uh, he was abused um, by a guy who's, you know, by Mel Phillips. And, you know, then later, when he was about 18 or 19, uh, they pro um, Terry Garvin, Terry Joyal, um, who headed, was one of the vice presidents of talent at the World Wrestling Federation, as the story goes, invited him over to his home and tried to uh, do, I don't know, I don't even know how to say it, to, you know, uh, how do I say it, Brian? Molest Rico. Him. So, what? Molest him. Molest him. Okay. That's a nice Have way of putting it. Have his way. Have his way. And, and he said no and kind of freaked out. And then he was fired a day or two later after being promised um, a new job. And a couple of months later, this kind of all surfaced in the news and became a huge scandal titan. Uh, Mel Phillips and Terry Joyal uh, both left the company. Um, and have never been back. Terry Joyal died several years ago, and um, that's basically the story. So, um, uh, let's see. Like George said on Seinfeld, it's not a lie if you believe it to be true. Okay, he says, WrestleMania was not a bad show. Brainbusters versus Strike Force, Blue Blazer versus Mr. Perfect, and Randy Savage versus Hulk Hogan were all good matches. Um, Blue Blazer Perfect for four minutes wasn't too bad. Savage and Hogan was a good match, but I think a lot of the other ones weren't that good. Uh, see, don't rip on Stern or he will make your life hell, brother. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, let's see. Get this guy. Uh, okay. If you can get Vince McMahon booked to a polygraph, I'll pay $1,000 for 10 minutes of uninterrupted questioning. Maybe if this, if they made this public, he'd raise enough money to save the XFL. Okay, this from Angelo goes, I taped both interviews and I'm glad to send you a copy. Please send me, um, you don't have to send me the Stern one, but I really do want to hear the, um, because the Stern one I'm sure I'll hear elsewhere. But if you got the Matt, Mike and the Mad Dog, I would love to get it and um, send it to uh, Box 1228, Campbell, California, 95009. And thank you very much, Angela. And you know what, Dave? If he's got, a, if, if he has an extra copy as well, if he could send it over to, uh, to us here, we can uh, we can splice it up and we can put it up. Okay. He already got it. So it's this, uh, this goes. What, let Dave, me, your, I'm sorry. Your let me just give the address out to him if he's listening. Okay. It's uh, 1450 okay. Broadway, eighth floor, New York, New York, 10018. Okay. And this goes, your name was just mentioned on the Mike Francesca show. I don't know what they said. It goes, wasn't Tom Cole in the audience with Elizabeth Poffo during the Donahue show? Absolutely. Yes, he was. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, you say Benoit and Helmsley are the best technical wrestlers in the WF, and while I agree, Benoit is the best all round wrestler. I believe Malenko is just as equal technically and better than Triple H. Different style. They're both excellent wrestlers. I, you know. Um, anyway, let's go to the calls. We've, got, we've had a full bank for a long, long time. Ed. In Texas, you're up first. Yeah, Dave, I wanted to talk about um, the XFL ratings, about a little article they had in the San Antonio paper down here. Uh-huh. And it's talking about how, for instance, they had to, like, the 1.6 was uh, the, the lowest uh, national rate, uh, lowest number ever. But that night here in San Antonio, the, the show drew a, a five rating. So there are markets that it's... San Antonio has always been a strong market for um, WWF. I know SmackDown does real well in, like... Uh, in, that's one of them. I know Birmingham's TV ratings are good too, but nationally the ratings are are, are horrible actually. Okay. And also you say like SmackDown gets good ratings here. They they do preempt SmackDown a lot for the Spurs games and they show it after the Spurs game. And I was mm-hmm. wondering how does that affect the national ratings at all? I mean, does it or I mean, is it enough to to bring it down a couple points or not? Uh, one market like San Antonio wouldn't even make a difference in a tenth of a point, generally speaking. At most, I mean, I, I don't even think it'd be a tenth of a point. I mean, like, like uh, if it's preempted in New York, L.A., or Chicago, that probably could mean, you know, one-tenth of a point. But a San Antonio market's not going to make a big amount of difference. Okay. If, it's, if it's airs. No, if it doesn't air at all. Well, if it airs uh, later on in the evening, would it still factor in? Yeah, yeah. But it would change It would change the number of uh, viewers slightly. But th- that slight change in the number of viewers would, would not even make a difference in the rating. Okay. And also, I wanted to ask uh, Rico... Um, What's his, like, weekly routine? How many matches does he have to have? How many times does he train? You know, does he have to have a side job to support himself? I train I train six days a week. We wrestle three to four times a week in shows, TV tapings, and practice uh, four days a week. Okay, do, 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 do they pay you enough to live comfortably, or do you have to have a side job? Well, like I said, I'm, I have a different... different um, Responsibilities, me having a wife and two children, house in Las Vegas, I have to support the household there and here. So it, it's a little bit more straining on me than, a, like I said, like a Randy Orton who's 20 years old and he can just pick up and shoot and, and relocate somewhere. Uh-huh. So, you know, di- different different situations, apples and oranges. Okay. Do you well, have that's, time that's pretty for much all I have, guys, and I just wanted to say a good luck, Rico. I hope you do make it. Thank you very much. You know, Eureka, do, do, do any of the guys there do any second jobs, or is pretty much everyone working full time as a wrestler? That's it's, it's, well, now as far as the schedule, the way it is, it's 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 you can't hold a job. I tried. Yeah. Now, now you worked a little bit um, with for some other companies. Oh, you worked uh, for Ron Fuller, and um, who else did you work for since you've been over there? I worked. Uh, let's see, I, I did Power Pro when they had the contract uh, in 1999. In fact, the, that was yeah. OVW and Power Pro champion. In a later part of 1999, and then I went with Ron Fuller at the K-Town SmackDown in Knoxville. Mm-hmm. I wrestled with him, and then I do a couple less less Thatcher shows. How's how are those? Fun. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I mean, I, anytime I can get in the ring, I mean, I I am having a blast just to get Somebody out. Told there. Me. I mean, I just oh, it's like a kid in the playground for me. Somebody told me, and I'm trying to remember if it was a less Thatcher show or not, but there was something that happened. Because, you know, originally that thing with Steve Austin, it was supposed to be Russ McCullough, and it ended up being you. I mean, they built it up on TV week after week. Russ McCullough, you know, big Russ McCullough was going to show up at the Louisville Gardens and challenge Steve Austin. Then all of a sudden, you know, the night of the show, I'm reading about what happened, and it's like it was Rico Constantino, and you kind of, um, you know, I get, and, and I, I was told that you kind of, um, you really impressed some people in the last uh, week or two before that, that Louisville show, I guess. I, I guess. I just, like I said, I just went out there and, did what I do, you know, and, just, and being a heel, I don't know, is, is more toward my personality. That way, you know, being a police officer, a bodyguard, you know, you tend to be sort of that way. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. So I, it, just, I just, it just comes easier for me this way. And I guess, just... I don't know, I went out there and I had, I had some great matches, like I said, with Nick Dinsmore, against Big Show, with Mark Henry, and um, we just, I don't know, had, had a great time. There was one line that you did, I'd say it's probably about five weeks ago on TV, um, and it, 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 you were out there, and you hadn't gone with Kenny Bolin, and I don't know, who, who's the, the the girl that they have? Uh, I, I don't know her name. Uh, there's a couple, I think Candy Mounds. Candy Mounds, that's the one. 
So Candy Mountain. So you were trying to like hit on her on the on the TV, right? Well, and like you I, said I, something. Kenny, Kenny wanted me to sign with Bowling Services, and I said no. And he, well, I said that's it. You know, you didn't get the title. I'm not signing. Well, he tried to appease me and say, well, listen, she'll dictate your life story. You can have whatever you want to do with Candy Mounds. That's what he was doing. He's trying to get me to to not say no definitely, and try to get me to postpone it while he works his little phone service magic and tries to get me another title shot. Right, and I, I just there was some line like where where you you're with her, and then you're going like, well, let me tell you about American Gladiators, and I thought it was just like this is just like you know Kurt Angle, you know what I mean? Yeah. All it was I remember the line. Yeah, he says, did I ever tell you how I won the American Gladiators? <laughs> like that. That was exactly like that line. Was like that's when I was really like, got sold on you as as a heel was just that that real you know it's like that that thing because everyone can relate to that thing of you know kind of like the guy being kind of like a dick you know what I mean trying to mm -hmm. pick up on a girl with that you know hey did I ever tell you I won the American Gladiators yeah just like it's that as corny as you can get but <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that... <laughs> one yeah, of those that things was... you just come off the top of your head yeah that was good let's go to Chris in Toronto Chris what's going on. Hey, how you guys doing? We're doing really good. Uh, just before I get to my questions, Dave, you're the new player that Iata has. Mm -hmm. It sucks. It, it complete like five ten minutes. It just buffers and goes down, then it's like hell to restart it. Actually, that has nothing to do with the player. It has everything to do with your internet connection. Well, how? Between, I, mean, I got between, DSL. No, 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 but it doesn't matter what what you have. Anywhere between where we send the signal out to you. Okay. Anything can happen in that in that period of time. Okay, you know what, Aldo? I'm in the chat room and everybody goes down at the same time. Everybody. Uh, it's it's definitely not on our end because we send the stream out. It's de it's depending on who your provider is, where it's going to. There's a, there's a lot of different variables. It has nothing to do with us because the stream goes out clean. It's where it's getting that last you know 10 feet or so to wherever you are. You know, it could go down. If a lot of people are logging in at the same time, you're going to have problems with it. Okay. Sunspot. Okay, uh, my first question, Dave, is that official, that WCW uh, sale? I don't know. Again, I tried to check right before the show, and I couldn't get it confirmed, but there were people talking about it within the industry, you know, like like basically in the last 45 minutes before we went on the air, so I don't know that it's official. I know the lawyers were down there uh, today, and there was some talk that, you know, after Vince did his round of talk shows that he might go to Atlanta and, and, and sign it, but that, again, I don't know that. I don't know that it's official right now. Well, the way but, word travels, if Vince was on uh, Howard Stern, and he said that, He'd already bought it, you know. He didn't say he'd bought it. He said down. he said he said in all likelihood he would yeah, buy it. So. That's how he phrased it on Stern, I believe. Again, not having heard Stern. You know what the price was? No, I don't. But uh, it's way less than it was two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, yeah. My second question. I, 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 yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, go the ahead. second question I had is that battle royal a rib? I hope not. I think that it's you like a not? rib, except we. No, it looks like it'll be fine. I think it's a I think it's a rib, but it's it, the rib is is they're actually going to do it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's a rib yeah. on fans. But I think it'd be funny just to watch, at least with the people they have in there, for a short period of time. Cool. And I have two last questions. One for Rico. Mm -hmm. uh, are you looking forward to working with Billy Gunn? I'm sorry. Are you looking forward to working with Billy Gunn? Billy Gunn? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Because he should be in OVW shortly. <laughs> oh. oh. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And Dave, have you seen a picture on the internet that you sort of inspired with your banana story? Uh oh. Uh oh. Have you I seen knew it? I never should have said. I knew. I knew when I said <laughs> that that I was going to regret opening my mouth, but I still said it anyway. Do, do no, I want to send you a link to where it is? It do, it doesn't have you in the picture. It actually has Vince McMahon and Trish Stratus in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Don't yeah, why not? Dave's not there. Send it over. Okay, so yeah. should I send it to you at a yada? Um, send it, no, send it to, uh, WrestlingObserver.com. Okay. Dave at WrestlingObserver.com. Okay. okay, dude. Thanks. Okay, thanks so much, Chris. Right, later. Chris in Massachusetts. Chris, what's going on? Hello? How you doing, Dave? I'm doing pretty good. Oh, I can barely hear you. Okay. I will scream. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got a quick observation for Rico. Rico, I hope your 20-year-old son doesn't decide, like, next year he wants to be a wrestler. You're screwed. Yeah. No, good thing he's <laughs> using his head for something other than turnbuckles. <laughs> He's in the computer field. Okay, um, Dave, I have a question. I kind of I posted this on A1 Wrestling's message boards, and I, I thought I'd ask you what you thought about it. I, I think I have an idea uh, what you're going to say. What do you think of the chances of um, you know Vince putting say like Shane and maybe Cornette in charge of WCW, or, or like Shane and a Jerry Jarrett or somebody, so that they could maybe keep the flavor of the Southern wrestling and 
kind of gear the two products to different audiences and keep them separate for a while. And maybe, you know, I mean, it would make sense for Vince to have two huge companies, right? But I mean, I, um, I don't see Jerry Jarrett, and I certainly don't see Jim Cornette being involved at all. As far as Shane running it, maybe with help from, like, Jim Ross, I certainly could see that as a possibility. Uh, you know, especially since Jim Ross knows a lot of the people, you know, having worked in WCW. As far as, like, the flavor, that southern flavor type thing, which is kind of was, has been gone from the WCW for a while anyway, I don't know that they're going to keep that. I don't, you know, Vince McMahon has a certain mentality of wrestling, and I think that, that that's what's going to, the WCW is going to reflect that mentality. I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't see him running a company, um, the style of the company that, you know, he basically he felt that his style defeated, and, and did, you know, if you really look at in the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, or maybe they defeated, realistically they defeated themselves, but that's... I just yeah. look at it like the diehards of, you know, it, it, the diehard fans that are left of WCW seem to prefer that. You know, even though you're right, I mean, it hasn't really been there in a while, but uh, maybe at least if they could maybe have sort of an homage to it, if not, you know, an outright emulation of it. But I see a point. But uh, do you really think that they'll just... Um, going to watch it no matter what. Do you think they'll just build it up to maybe the one big pay-per-view like WrestleMania next year and then absorb the company? Or, or don't, don't you think, I mean, I understand that Vince is a creature uh, I, don't, I, don't, I think it would be stupid for one pay-per-view. I think you could go, like, you could build it up for a year and then do the feud for a year. But, you know, sooner or, late, sooner or later, you know, one side has to, you know, one of these names has to dis disappear, and the name that disappears will be WCW. Obviously, WWF is a name that's, as long as Vince McMahon and the McMahon family are around, the WF name will be, you know, will be the name. You know, they, you know what I mean? They don't, I don't think that they want in the long run to have, have a confused marketplace. And, and that name that will survive is WWF. But, I mean, I think that they should make as much money as they can with the WCW name, um, you know, with the feud, you know, when they do it. And, you know, they could do way more than one pay per view. You could go for a long, long time with that feud. Yeah. Well, I, I just think it would make sense. I mean, I, I can't imagine, you know, I mean, I can't imagine because every time you think Vince won't do like the WBF again, you get the XFL. But, I mean, it just well, seems they, to me that it would be so much better if he just targeted the different demographic and tried to build companies up. And, the, you know, they wouldn't really be cannibalizing each other if he did it right, but you're probably right. I mean, he'll probably it'll probably be WWF light, and eventually it'll be absorbed. Um, yeah, I think that one will be absorbed. I mean, they may do something. Yeah, I don't see him making it as, as a farm system because he's got the farm systems. And also the other thing is, the farm system can only exist on a small time level because if you put a guy on national television, you know, in, in, inherently they're going to have to be ready for national television. And if they're ready for national television, um, it doesn't matter if it's WCW or WWF. You know what I mean? It's like you can't use WCW as the last step before WWF. Um, cause it's, I, I just don't, you know, it, when, once people recognize that that's the case, they'll know that it's the one that's l less important to watch and why, you know. And for the same reason why, you know, people will go to Major League Baseball but won't go to Triple A Baseball. Yeah. You know, it, it's got to be kept at a Major League level, and it can't be like, okay, we start at Ohio Valley, then we go to Memphis, then we go to WCW, then we go to WWF, then all of a sudden, you know, I, I just don't see that one, that progression. Yeah. Can I, I just one more quick observation for Rico. Rico, I was just on, OV, on the uh, OVW website while I was waiting to get on, and uh, looking at your background, I think you're all set, because I think, you know, next time Steve Austin wants to use that CDL license, I mean, you've been run over by cars, you've been hit with bullets, I mean, you're all set. <laughs> you're going to be in the big angles. <laughs> That's right. <Yeah. laughs> well, good, good luck, Rico, and thanks a lot, Dave. Thank you so much. Okay, okay, very welcome. Let's go to Ben in New Jersey. Ben, what's going on? Hey, how are you guys doing? Very good. Um, I have a couple of real quick, uh, quick questions for you, Dave. Um, I was just wondering, uh, what's the status of Jerry Lynn and uh, Tajiri? Jerry Lynn should be starting in WWF soon. I mean, it might even be as early as Monday, but, but soon. And Tajiri, I don't know. Um, I mean, I know he's with them, but I don't know what, um, you know, I don't know anything of a starting date. Uh, Jerry wrestled in Mexico two weeks ago, and I haven't seen him. I don't think he's wrestled since then. I mean, he may have done some independent stuff that I'm not aware of, or that I don't remember. Oh, but he's, uh, he's, with, he's with the WWF. I just, I, he's another one of those guys I think they don't really know what, um, what they're going to exactly do with him. They're going to yeah. have, they got a lot of guys like that right about now. Yeah, because um, they're having, um, I was thinking like, um, a possible situation where they could put Jerry Lynn in, um, because you know how they're going to have, um, they're thinking about that, um, six man triple threat, uh, TLC match at WrestleMania. And I throw them in with the, with the Hardys? Yeah. Um, I've heard that suggested many times. It wouldn't surprise me at all. 
that they do that. Um, and if they were to do that, I can also see an angle of the ECW. Because what you would got is, if you have the Hardys with uh, Jerry Lynn in the corner, if you have um, you know the Dudleys with Spike, and then you've got Edge and Christian with Rhino, what you could do is, is you could have everyone turn on Edge, Christian, and, and the uh, Hardys. Yeah. And then the Hardys and Edge and Christian can be the guys who fight the ECW invasion. So they're... They're high enough on the card. They're working tag teams. You know, use the Dudleys as the strong ECW leader because the Dudleys are over. So, I mean, I can, I mean, I don't know that that's their idea. Um, but, I mean, I see, you know, a lot of people have suggested it and it sounds real viable to me. Yeah. Um, I had one real, uh, quick question. Um, how long do you think, like, the WWF is going to go on with the Triple H Stephanie thing? You know, do you think they're going to stay together for a while? Forever, 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 forever. They're never going to, they're never going to break up. And the reason is because neither can ever dump the other one. Yeah, because I was thinking, I was like, if they, if they uh, break up, you know, what, what's left for Stephanie and what, you know. I mean, Triple oh, there'll, there'll be on, something. You know. Dude, there'll be something for, for both of them. It's just the whole ego thing. Who's going to dump who? Yeah, no, who, which one of them is going to agree to be dumped? We can't even get them to do jobs. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> not, not really, but sort of really. <laughs> all right, well, that's all I had. Uh, thanks, guys. Okay, let's go to, is it uh, Rick in New York? Hello. Hello. Hey, Dave, how, are how you? you doing? Really good. I heard a very weird rumor. A friend of mine works for FX Channel, mm -hmm. and he said that Bischoff was talking to him again about doing a, a new a promotion, a, a new wrestling order. NWO? Yeah, it's not going to be NWO. It's the end, that's the initials, but it's going to be called the New Wrestling Order. Wouldn't shock me. That's that's what I, a friend of mine works there. I can't say his name, but that's what he told me. Hmm. Um, wouldn't I mean I wouldn't wouldn't shock me if that if that would be the, the the idea that makes perfect sense. Now the only problem is is that who's he gonna get? I don't know. Who's he gonna get? Well, here's an interesting thing. WCW owns the trademark to NWO. Now if Vince is not buying that trademark, now you we may have just blown it for Eric Bischoff because if it's a seal if if he's not signed it. He may ask them to throw in that trademark right about now. <laughs> well, I, listen, if I hear Before anything else, Dave, deal, I'll call so. in and tell you what's going on. Because okay, I asked my friend for... to keep on top of it. Okay. Okay? All right. It's good talking to you guys. Take care. Okay, let's go to uh, Jim. Jim, what's up? Hey, how are you doing, Dave? Very good. Uh, I'm a big fan of the show. Um, Thank you. Actually, this is a good lead-in from the last caller. Um, what do you think of, of Vince? Starting up WCW more or less to block another promotion from coming on the air. <laughs> I think that's eighty percent, sixty to eighty percent of it, right there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, uh, it would definitely if, block if he, you know, he, anybody else from he, coming in because it would be too much saturation. It's not so much too much saturation, but everybody. Can, yeah, he'd, he'd, yeah. It's like how do you start up unless you have you know? Um, I mean, you, you would if if if, you, if he took all of the key guys from WCW and he won't take everyone. Mm -hmm. But but if he takes Goldberg and let's say Kevin Nash, and even Kevin Nash really doesn't mean anything by himself anyway. But if he took Goldberg, Kevin Nash, Hogan, and WCW, you know, like and whoever wants to start something, whether it be Eric Bischoff or somebody else, that the guys that that you know the only guys that they'll have are the guys Vince doesn't want, let's say like Alex Luger as the cornerstone. Uh, you just don't got enough juice to compete. That, that's you know, true. Alex Luger I never by really himself. Thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right. So that's I think that's a lot of it. He's buying. By buying WCW, especially with these time slots on TBS being canceled, he is buying a lack of serious competition for years and years. Mm -hmm. It's a definite investment for him, that's for sure. It's the right move for him. That's mm -hmm. absolutely the right move. Um, I also had another question. Um, it seems like for the past few weeks they had been teasing a Hardy Boys breakup, um, you mm -hmm. know, with Lita. And everything. It seems like they've kind of shelved that. Do you think that's going to come to head at WrestleMania, or? Well, if they do, if they do the thing that we talked about, you know, like with an ECW thing, then it, it makes no sense to break them up now because yeah. then they'll have something to do. But um, I, I have no doubt, you know, three weeks ago that the plan was to break up the Hardy Boys, mm -hmm. and then it just they just sort of stopped. It, so I got a feeling that, that they changed plans, or we'll find out at WrestleMania. Like if they just do it, then I guess that they just decided to like cool it up for a little while and, and then shoot it. But I, I, I think from watching the TV. My gut is is that they um, they change they just change their mind because yeah, they got something else like to do. It. it would lead to some good matches, but I think they change their mind. The day will come. We'll see it. You know, maybe oh, it'll be six months later. Sure. But yeah, but we're going to end up seeing it anyway. So. Mm -hmm. um, and I just had one other comment to make. Um, earlier, you had a caller that was complaining about the player on the on the page. Yes. Um, tell him to use 
a real player instead. I had the same problem yesterday, and it's been rock solid all day today. So that's just a, a hint out to all the listeners. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dave. Thanks very much. Okay. Al, Actually, anybody else we need to? Yeah, no, uh, we can we can hold off on the next couple of calls until the break. Just I wanted to make an, another mention about the player because we have gotten a couple of emails about it. If you're using Windows Media Player, try and switch to the real uh, real audio player. It may help a little bit. And also, if you're using AOL as your primary subscriber service, um, there are lots of problems with AOL in regards to uh, you know the, in regards to uh, AOL itself. So you just you know, there's not much that we can do about that um, except switch to the real player, and, and hopefully that'll help you out. But uh, I've noticed a couple of emails saying uh, people with the Windows Media Player. A lot of it has to do if you're using AOL. Um, AOL has a lot of problems for the fact they don't have an unlimited amount of bandwidth. Uh, what was it like to work with the power team? What's it like to work with the power? Oh, that's a every week job. You travel all over the country, basically all over the world. Um, it's taxing on your body, but it's real rewarding. I mean, I like talking to teens, um, you know, getting them out of, like, drug abuse and stuff like that, um, helping them turn their lives around to realize, you know, how special they are as a person because, you know, and there's a lot more to live for, you know, stuff like that. I love doing that. Uh, let's, go to, let's, let's go to a Reese in Virginia. Reese, what's going on? Uh, how are you doing, Dave? Doing good. Um, I'm a big fan of Shawn Michaels, and I noticed last week when Triple H attacked Sh- Shane on Raw, I was thinking, I was like, I was wondering if they were like going to bring Shawn Michaels back to maybe side with Shane. Possibly. Since Vince has Triple H siding with him. Do you think that would make any sense, or? Definite possibility. I, I mean, everyone expects, Shawn Michaels will be back imminently. I don't know if that'll mean this Monday, if it'll mean... The, at WrestleMania, mm-hmm. I'm expecting that, that his first match back is going to be at the Backlash pay-per-view. Okay. I think that the feeling was that why, they're going to do a record buy rate, mm-hmm. close to a record. Yeah, at WrestleMania. Um, so they don't really at WrestleMania, that. so why waste yeah. a Shawn Michaels match when you when you probably a month later, exactly. when there's kind of that letdown, you yeah. kind of need something to jack it up, and so let's bring Shawn Michaels back. Exactly. So I think that's the, uh, that's the working idea. I think the thing is, too, with that match is they're talking about Linda being there in the wheelchair, and I think a lot of people are figuring that she's just going to jump out of it or whatever. Yeah. And if you have Michaels there and she does that, it's going to mm-hmm. like overshadow him. Yeah, it's like overshadow her. There. Okay, so. yeah. Another thing I was going to say is with all the like talent and like the main event, in the WWF, like so much main event talent, like if he comes back, is he actually really going to ever have a chance to actually even carry the belt, or is he going to be like? I, a... I, I I don't think that anyone's thinking along those lines because he's never going to come back full time. I don't think. I mean, again, he's going to do one match, and then the idea is how his body holds up. I mean, you got to remember this is a guy whose doctor told him never to wrestle again. Yeah. And then again, Rico's been shot, and he's wrestling four nights a week, five nights a week. <laughs> but um, <laughs> and he was told uh, he's going to be out for eight months, and mm-hmm. we're a lot less than eight months away since that injury. Yeah. So, so, so you don't, you don't, you don't know. But I think that they, they are. I was, I was reading like, that he wanted to like try to wrestle like two or three matches a month, and I'm saying with that you can wrestle a pay per view match and maybe two Raws, and I don't see why you couldn't. Um, hold yeah, but it I, up. I, I, I don't see them going with the title thing on him. Certainly, I don't think they're thinking in that position now. Mm-hmm. If he comes back, he's as good as he ever was, and he can wrestle a pretty regular schedule. Uh, he might end up in that mix. Then again, you know. Look at the competition. I mean, he's he's exactly. never going to be more over than Austin. Yeah, uh, he's going to have a hard time surpassing Triple H. Uh, never pass The Rock. Well, I think I he's down talent... Triple H. What? I think I think he probably could surpass Triple Politically? H. Politically, you think so? He Polit- kind of got Triple H on into the thing with DX and everything. Yeah, but I think politically, politically, Triple H has come a long way. Yeah, I, I don't see tomorrow. Shawn Michaels surpassing him. Um, but you know, hey, he's a super talent, so who knows? Yeah. All right. Well, that's all I have. Okay. Right, thanks very much. Let's go to Sean in PA. Sean, what's up? Hey Dave, how's it going? Hey, it's going uh, really I've good. I got a question for Rico. Um, with with everything that's gone on in the past week, are you worried about the developmental deals being cut? Am I am I worried about them? Yeah. Mm, no, I I can't cloud my mind with that. I just have to keep looking forward, and believe in myself, and believe what I'm doing is is correct. And you know, uh, having them look at me and say, "Yeah, he's worth keeping," you know, type thing. I can't I can't worry about and be a pessimist about that stuff because it might affect. My ability in the ring. Right. Okay. Well, uh, I wish you luck, man. Um, Thank you very much, hey, Dave. I've got a couple cool questions. Um, sure. Have there been any uh, any more participants in the uh, battle royal yet announced? 
Kamala. Just Kamala. Kamala. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I don't know. That should be about it. Thanks a lot, Dave. Okay. All right, let's go to Henry in Arkansas. Henry, what's up? How's it going, guys? Going good. This is uh, this is Henry. Um, I have a couple questions for Rico. Hello, Henry. Go ahead. Hey, uh, I was wondering, uh, I know that you're involved with the power team. I was wondering if you're still involved in ministry somehow. Mm. Well, no, not not out here in Kentucky. Uh, do attend church at home, but I, I, with this schedule here, you don't have much time to get out and outreach a lot. I mean, I'm busy seven days a week. Sometimes I'll wrestle anywhere from uh, seven to 21 days straight before a day off. Wow. Um, another question I had is, um, who are your favorite piece of people to work with? Who are my favorite people? Yes. Well, right now with the OVW roster, everybody. Everybody. I mean, there is such a pool of talent here, and everybody adds a like. It's like a big stew. Everybody has their own little flavor, own little spice, and you can pick up something from everybody. And and it just it's like real. I mean, I wrestled e- EWF for a while, but OVW. I mean, what they put together here and what Cornette and Danny have done with Danny's original guys, and now the developmental is coming in. I mean, there's athletes galore. I mean, anything can happen in these matches. They're very exciting. Television is very exciting now. Even the even the house shows are very exciting. Wow. Because everybody has a drive. It's just unbelievable. If WWF called you up tomorrow, what guys up there would you just love to work with? If they called me up tomorrow? Besides, like, the obvious guys like Austin. Oh, man. I mean, man, I like to work with X-Pac. You know, uh, matches like that, because I like running and flying. I like to work against Jericho, Kurt, mm-hmm. you know, Stone Cold, you know, stuff like what, that. I mean, I'm, I'm like that style. What, what, is there a difference as far as the mentality? Because now, I mean, I guess the big shows for OBW, not the biggest big shows, but kind of like your biggest, you know, what, you know, small, your second level shows, I guess, I guess have been moved to uh, Coyote's Bar. And I guess you just wrestled there Tuesday night. And right. What's the difference between wrestling at Coyotes and like the the other shows that you've been doing? Because I know that they kind of bill them as more X-rated. I guess that's what they are called. They're called OVW X-rated. Yeah, that's what it is OVW X-rated. But me being the role model, you know, I don't like going into a place like that. In fact, that was my big big stink the last time you were taking the role model and putting him in a place <clears> of decadence. You know, alcohol <laughs> has never touched my lips and stuff like that, and I don't curse or so. I'm you know I'm kind of the same there as I am out. You know, but you know. There's a different flavor in Coyotes. We wrestle there once once a month, and then we go to St. Teresa's Gym the other three Tuesdays. Now, did you draw? How, how are the crowds at Coyotes? Have they been pretty strong? The last one was pretty strong. Yeah, they were really into it. Mm-hmm. I took on Leviathan the last time. Oh my! What a monster! <laughs> uh oh. How, how's it like? Uh, how's it like working with him? Because you got to work a totally different style with him than everybody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just don't get hit. <laughs> you just do a lot of running. <laughs> so now, with you working with him, is, is are they doing like a turn with him, or is it just something that they threw together just to throw it together, just change the mix? Well, kind of, it kind of got me in that one. What they did is they, um, you know, I, I was, you know, taking. Well, I beat him, I beat him, and I, I'm looking for the biggest, the baddest, the toughest competition, not thinking that he'd ever put me against a demon. That's what he did. So it's kind of like a, a stuff into Kenny in my face. And, uh, you know, here I am, the role model, and going against a demon. (laughs) And the demon's the baby face, right? (laughs) Well, in that match, I guess he was. I mean, I didn't get any cheers. Yeah. You know, I was, I got called a lot of names that we don't think you can say on this air. (laughs) Henry, anything else? Yes, uh, Rico, uh, I don't know what happened earlier, but I did another portrait, and it's on its way. Um, I love the enthusiasm that you bring to OVW and keep up the good work. Thank you so much, Henry. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Al, any more calls or should I start hitting emails? Who from Texas? Okay, let's go to Mark. What's up? Hello, uh, hello Dave. Hey. How are you doing? I'm doing really good. Um, I'm a first-time caller. Um, I just uh, earlier this year got into uh, listening to your show, and I think you do uh, a great show. And um, just had some uh, uh, questions about the whole WCW thing I wanted to ask you. Sure. Um, do you think it's uh, legit, or do you think this is some kind of master <laughs> gimmick that Eric Bischoff come up with? Oh, my God. Are you, are you serious? 
<laughs> I was just curious. I mean, uh, um, no, no, it's it's um, unless unless he convinced Vince McMahon and uh, and the New York Times to work his angle with him. Yeah. Well, uh, what what have you heard recently on it? I mean, what's what's going to happen with WCW? Um, it's almost if it has not been sold in the last couple of hours to WWF, it's pretty imminent unless something breaks down at the last minute. I mean, Vince McMahon all but confirmed it. You know, I mean, he said in all likelihood they would own it, and I mean right. that, that time frame is probably you know hourly or daily as opposed to like not even a week when uh -huh. they will own it. Do you think they will keep it as a separate? promotion or will they just absorb the ones they want and I, I guess the plan is to keep it as a separate promotion for now inevitably it won't be but you know for a while I think that they I think the mentality would be to rebuild it from uh -huh. a promotion versus promotion feud and then from that point on you know who knows because again these guys most of this booking is actually planned like week week in a week out and it can change based on crowd reaction so who knows other than I think that the working idea is to start by keeping them separate right right well, uh, I'd just like to say that you and Brian do a good show. Um, you treat your callers with heck of a lot more respect than Jeremy Borash or Bob Ryder do. Because uh, I called in last night to them on WCW Live, and, and you know, I understand they're probably getting tired of being asked about the whole WCW thing, but uh, Jeremy Borash was a little bit kind of rude to me, and then I got cut off in my when I was talking to him, so I thought that was kind of rude. <laughs> but uh, i just like to say uh, uh, y'all do a great show and uh, keep up the good work, and I uh, look forward to seeing what happens with WCW and everything. So, okay. Uh, take care, guys. Take okay, care. thanks very much. Okay, let me get into this. Can't one yell at a nice caller. No. No. <laughs> One reason why SmackDown might not get a higher rating is because UPN is not available in several markets. I live in Austin with over a million people, and there's no UPN. There's actually, in fact, in the Observer, not every week, but a lot of weeks, what I put in for SmackDown is what's called a realistic rating. And, in, and there's right. The, the actual rating of, of the UPN show, what we get, like let's say last week was a 4-3, that is an unfair number because there's about 12% of the country that doesn't get UPN. So if you actually, like... Multiplied that number by one point, actually the number would be 1.14, or I think. I got it upstairs. You'll actually get what is a more realistic number for the UPN rating. So it, it does, now that doesn't affect the cable ratings, because cable ratings are determined by the number of people who can actually get the station, but the UPN rating is determined by the number of homes in the entire country. So yeah, it is a little bit unfair, and, the, and every show on UPN is kind of unfairly penalized as compared to, say, NBC. Uh, ABC, CBS, and Fox, because they're in like every, you know, pretty much everybody's got them. Yeah. So that that's a that's a valid point there. Uh, let me see. Uh, I honestly expect to see WCW on USA. Uh, do not expect that. Um, especially now. Especially now. There's no way. Um, well, first of all, they can't because. Okay, here's what you got to realize. Vince McMahon has a contract with Viacom. And the contract is exclusivity for all WF programming, and WCW is WWF programming. Okay, it will be is under the umbrella of WF Entertainment. I mean, that's why it so, fell through originally. That's the reason the sale fell through. So, if there is a WCW television show, and I'm sure there will be, because McMahon certainly got enough juice, it will be on a Viacom station, whether it is MTV, CNN, which is the most likely, or something in the Viacom system. So that's where they're gonna they're gonna end up with a TV almost for sure, and it'll be on more. It'll be a bit of Viacom. There's no way. There's no way it'll be USA, there's no way it'll be TBS, there's no way it'll be Fox, there's no way it'll be E or anything like that. Uh, you always say that WCW had the best roster of all time around 1997. The question I want to ask is, what about the current WF roster? It is deeper than WCW's was, and I feel better, at least at a main event level. It is better at a main event level. I don't think that at an undercard level it's as deep, but I guess I would if I'd have to go through person by person. Because WWF does not have a lot of weak slots, and WCW had a lot of weak slots, but WCW had... I, I would guess more good workers. Up and uh, down maybe, the card. Yeah, I think they had the, the, they had the number of them, but they did not use them correctly. Because there were guys, like Silver King, just as an example, who nobody thinks of. But if you watch him now, you go, you almost cry. I mean, this guy's excellent. And and WWF, the only guy I would say in WWF that's, that's very good, that people really don't know is really good because he never gets time except on the... Um, on, like, generally speaking, except on like Metal and Jack, is uh, S.A. Rios, who's, who's a really good wrestler. You know, I mean, good high flyer. He's improved a lot in the ring. I mean, much better than he used to be. Um, 
And and WCW had many many guys better than S.A. Rios that you know just they just wouldn't do nothing with. Uh, this is from Jamie Girard, who goes, The problem with people like Brent Brozell and Phil Mushnick being the most visible detractors of the WF is simple. Because they're so strident and give the appearance of having personal vendettas, any good points they raise about the WF's contact and business practices are lost. Strong point. I, I agree. The fact that the mainstream media is generally totally unprepared and uninformed about the business, Vince McMahon will always be able to position himself as a martyr against the evil censorship freaks and the mainstream media that just doesn't get it. Um, Okay, not but not with the media. I mean, Vin, Vince has his detractors in the media, something fierce, too, as this XFL has certainly shown. As a side note, do you think a Vince McMahon-owned WCW runs the risk of being perceived as WWF light and being rejected by the core WCW audience? I think that his plan is not to appeal so much to the WCW audience because it's so small, but to appeal to the WWF audience. Yeah. And, and, and the one thing is, unlike the XFL, which is trying to, which, which the attempt was to get wrestling fans to watch football, and they're in just entirely different things, is that WCW is not entirely different. They are both professional wrestling. So, I mean, the, the odds of Vince McMahon being able to get WF fans to watch WCW are much better, uh, than XFL, obviously. Plus, there's uh, gonna be, I mean, there aren't a, there isn't a huge core of like hardcore WCW fans right now, but I'd say the majority of them, you know, they're gonna watch no matter who owns it. Um, yeah, I would add so. them and then add in whatever Vince can get from the regular WWF audience, and it should do okay. Yeah, this is from Ben Miller who goes. I think there are invariably going to be startups to try over the next f five years, or goes. You see any and making money over the next five years? I mean, there's going to be a lot of people who start up. The problem is, is to, to start up and actually compete. The stakes to compete now are just so high. It's not like, it's not like before where you could run a regional territory profitably. I mean, well, we when we've had like. Like promoters like Roland Alexander or um, um, uh, what's Rick Bassman, and then like a lot of the smaller promoters, to run a circuit like like like, like Rico's working for Ohio Valley, you know, a lot of that is because the WWF is helping with it. I mean, it's it's hard to actually draw enough people to fund the whole circuit. I mean, if if Ohio Valley had to pay the salaries, you know, of of all of the guys that are working there, they'd be bankrupt really really fast. It's just you know, like these guys get their contracts, many of them. From WWF, and and because of that, Ohio Valley is able to exist at its level as a as a developmental thing. But if you're talking about like trying to compete nationally, um, you need a strong national outlet, and you're going to have to figure out a way to make money going to these arenas. And it's not that easy when people sit and wait for the WWF as the major league. It's it's just so so hard. And he also goes, I love the show with Don Fry, Frank Shamrock, and Bobby Heenan. If you put it up in the archives, I'd love to be able to listen to it. I, I hope. Okay, that, that was one of my favorite shows. Uh, that actually. should be up uh, either today or tomorrow. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think we get some more stuff here. Uh, with the idea of WCW being run as a separate company, what will happen to the talent? That's uh, one of those loaded questions that we don't know. Uh, let's see. I'm going to ask this one to Rico as, as a fan. Who do you think is a better athlete, Triple H or Rock, just as an athlete? Oh my gosh, that's a close one because of the style they work. But I, I think Triple H is awesome. I mean, just what he does in the ring, how he makes other people look, that's an ability. I didn't realize that when I was a baby on what the heels do, and it, and being on this side, you know, I respect him a lot more. And I, I think it's Triple H. When you, as, as a wrestler, when you look at that WWF roster. I mean, who would you emulate? And also, um, I was looking at your bio. Were you were you a fan as a kid of like Ray Stevens and those guys, or, mm -hmm. or growing up? Oh, Rocky Johnson, Ray Stevens. It was called Big Time Wrestling in Las Vegas. Right. right. Yeah, that's the same wrestling I grew up on. Yeah, the Sheik, the guy that tapped his boot, loaded his boots. Spit, the, the Great Mephisto. Himself. The Great Mephisto. Frank yeah, the Mephisto. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Rocky Johnson, Ray Stevens. Yeah. Uh, who do I emulate in WWF roster now? No, not emulate, but who would you? Who do you look at and like? I guess like, like as 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 a performer, admire you know the most, or or the top guys that you would you know look at and just go you know this is this is kind of my goal. I wish I could be like as as good as this guy, and and you know I just or, or you're like I don't know like on like you know that guy just he's he's really got it. Well, like I said, Triple H is a heck of an athlete. I respect him for what he does. Stone Cold going out there, Rock for what he does, Angle. For what he does, I mean, it's like I don't just take just one. I mean, it's like a poker hand to me. I take a, what the best this one has, the best this one has, and I try to learn from all the top stars because they are top top guys. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of like, you know, just take a little from each of them. I like the way he does this. I like the way he does that, you know. And I'll take it and turn it into my own, and then and try, and try to do it. 
I, I know that this is stuff that's the political stuff that was obviously out of your hands, but what was your thoughts when um, the thing with Memphis, because you were going down, you were, in fact, you were the champion in Memphis, and then basically, you know, for political reasons, you stopped going. Well, yeah, that that's what happened. Um, I was Ohio Valley champ and Memphis champ at the same time. I enjoyed Memphis TV. Uh, I was a baby down there, and all of a sudden, just for like I said, politically, just it just took work away from me. See, I like working because it's more practice. See, and I, I like getting out there and just learning and learning. Every match, I learn something new. You know, every practice, I learn something new. So when they took Memphis away, I was kind of like, oh, now I'm just back to one. More an organization and working so many times a week, you know, because, you know, when I'm here, like I said, I, I have nothing to do except work. I mean, my family's back in Las Vegas. I'm here. And for me, just to sit idle at home is not it's not profitable for me. It's not, you know, I, I have to get out and do something. Now it's watch tapes, but now we have a, a tougher schedule, a lot more practices. So we, I'm, I'm pretty busy now. You know, but one I thing that we actually see. get questions, that we get questions on a lot, at, at, as far as training goes, I mean, I'm talking about, I'm not talking, I'm not talking about this, this is actually weight training and uh, bodybuilding per se. How do you approach it now as compared to, say, as, at the age of 38, 39, as compared to, say, 25? Or, or is it exactly the same, and, and, or is it just the same for you? I've always been intense my whole life. I mean, just when I focus in on something, I zero on something, zero in on something, it's 120%. I don't give it any less, and that's the way I attack everything. I'll probably be the way until the day I die. You know, I mean, when I was a police officer, I graduated number one in, in police academy in Nevada. When I was a gladiators, I went through 20,000 people and, and picked one of 20 to compete. I was champion there. I got picked to go to France and do their version of, of gladiators. I came out champion there. It's just, that's just the way I'm, I'm geared. That's the way God made me. Just intense. Have you had to change anything over the years, like, um, you know, not lifting as heavy or anything like that? Well, well, yeah, when I was bodybuilding, I lifted heavier, but now I don't lift as heavy because I don't want to become stiff and, like they say, quote, unquote, muscle-bound because then I lose my agility in the ring. I like to be limber. I stretch a lot, and I lift, you know, put on, you know, some more size, but I don't want to be bound or tight because if you have the tight muscles, that's where you get strains, pulls, and then, then when you're injured, you're out, as I, as I know with the torn knee tendon. We are actually totally out of time. Rico, I want to thank you very much for joining us on what was quite a show. Well, thank you. <laughs> quite a and day I just say, here. If you want to check on any other superstars in OVW, we have a website, ovwrestling.com. And I have an email page. I have my own personal web page, ricocostantino.com. If you want to get to it, you can go to OV Wrestling, And i got a clickable link there. And check out all the other superstars under developmental and tell stories on everybody. You know, it's a really informative page. Cool. And we'll be following your progress because I watch OVW tapes just about every week. And, well, thank uh, you. I, I love watching it because it reminds me of uh, Mid South Wrestling in 1985, which was actually uh, a real enjoyable period of wrestling because uh, that's where Jim, that's kind of Jim, where Jim Cornette got a lot of his real knowledge of wrestling. And it's uh, the booking; it's uh, very logical booking. You don't watch that. You know, one, one thing I love about OVW is when I watch it and I watch the angles, I don't get like mad like I always used to get. Watching WCW angles that make no sense. <laughs> oh, I tell you that, that he has a brain in that head of his. He's he's very smart. I'm very focused. With him. Hey, do you do you get to? Do, I mean, I guess you have to look at those format sheets, don't you? Mm-hmm. Every TV, I mean, what is, what is it, like thirty handwritten pages or something? Uh, that that's a small page. It is. <laughs> <laughs> the guy scripts everything out. But anyway, um, Rico, I want to thank you very much. Thank uh, you I want to remind everyone. Guys. Okay, you're very welcome. Tomorrow we're going to have superstar Billy Graham. We're also going to have clips probably of that uh, FA interview. And we may even have Phil Mushnick for all I know. We're going to, but I, will, I know we're going to have an exciting show tomorrow because I'm looking forward to Billy Graham. We'll see you at five.